I've been told, and I'm going to try and do a good job with it, that I got to check with uh, Michael and Timothy about the monitor, the ear uh, piece that I've got. That way you guys can hear me. There were some technical difficulties. I think it was my fault, of course, but of course, I was going to try and blame it on something else, but I will admit it. I didn't have it on, and it's all good. So, um, I just want to say that, you know, we're starting this Fountainhead Kids up front, and it's a really exciting thing for me, and I know it is for Derek as well, but it should be an exciting thing for us as a congregation as well. And more importantly, for the church as a whole, because, you know, I've always heard this and I hadn't heard it in a while, but you you ever heard people saying that you guys are people of the book, that you guys knew book, chapter and verse on all kinds of things. That's the type of people that we need to be. Amen. We need to be people who know what the Word says and why it says it and where it's at. What a blessing this is going to be for our young ones to be excited about learning the Word of God. So if you guys know kids who want to come and be a part of this, invite those ones who aren't here to come and be a part of this work because it really is going to be something that will be a blessing not only to these kids but to you guys as well. I mean, I'll be honest, when I started looking at that list and I started covering up where some stuff was at, I was falling a little bit short. I mean, I had to do a little bit of studying myself. I thought, man, I need if I'm going to be the teacher of this, I better know where the stuff's at, right? So anyway, I wanted to kind of connect this uh, story of Hannah with the beginning of this FH Kids, because it is such a good story about the love of a child, the uh, way that a mother shows her love to him and also to the Lord. You know, motherhood is a privilege and a very important responsibility, wouldn't you say? And think about the role the mother plays in nurturing and developing a child. You know, a mother's Love is special and unique. But above all things, a mother's duty is to raise a child to follow and serve the Lord. Amen? And that not only is for the mother, but it's also for the father. But how difficult it must have been for a woman, one who had the heart to be a mother, a desire to nurture and love a young life, but didn't have the ability to have a child. This is the story of Hannah. If you would turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 1. And you guys know the story, and I don't want to spend a lot of time in this, but we know that, uh, that Hannah's husband had another wife, and she could have kids, and Hannah couldn't. And therefore, in verse 6, of 1 Samuel chapter 1, it says, And her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord that she provoked her. Therefore, she wept and did not eat. She not only could not bear children, but she was being provoked by this other wife, And because of that, she wept and she would not eat. But look at what it says in verse 8. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord, And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life 
and no razor shall come upon his head. Hannah hurt deeply because she wanted to be a mother. In her pain, she cries out to the Lord. When we're in pain, just a side note, there is no better place to go than to the throne of grace. Amen? When we are in time of need, when we have struggles in our lives, when we have things that may worry us or bring us down, there is no better place to be than at the throne of grace. Because when we approach the throne of grace, we can approach it boldly. And we can approach it boldly and ask for things. And the Bible tells us that we can receive grace and mercy in our time of need. This evening, I want us to look at two things. And the lesson will be yours. Not a long lesson. Just, I hope, an encouraging lesson for us to think about. The first thing that I would like for us to consider, and we talked about this a little bit in our Proverbs class on Sunday morning uh, last week, Hannah makes a vow. Think about the vow that she makes in verse 11. She says, look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me. She says, give me a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. And no razor shall come upon his head. Hannah vows she will give her son to God literally. Think about that, parents. Think about receiving a child. You don't have one. But if you get one, you're going to give it back to the Lord literally to be in the tabernacle with Eli. What a difficult situation. But here she was pleading to God. Here she was making this vow to God. And the thing about it, the thing that we need to consider, the thing that we need to remember is vows are to be taken very serious. Amen? Look at this in Deuteronomy chapter 23 when it talks about a vow. It says, when you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it. For the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and it would be sin to you. But if you abstain from vowing, it shall not be a sin to you. That which has gone from your lips you shall keep and perform. For you voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised with your mouth. Think about that. You have voluntarily vowed this. You have voluntarily said whatever this vow is. Here was Hannah voluntarily making this vow. Brethren, I want us to think about our Christian life. I want us to think about our Christian walk. Have we made a vow to God? Have we told the Lord that we are going to serve him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind? Absolutely, if you're a child of God. Think about this in James, though, stepping into the New Testament, talking about these vows and these things. But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath. But what should you do? You should let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. If you say you're going to do it, then you better do it. Amen? If you say that you're going to be a Christian, be a Christian. If you say that you're going to forgive, then forgive. If you're going to say that you're not going to hold a grudge, don't hold a grudge. If you say that you're going to love your brother and not hate him, then love him and don't hate him. Isn't it so true, brethren? That we say these things and we can think them all day long, but putting them into practice becomes difficult for us sometimes. Does it not? Putting the things into action is sometimes very difficult for us as children of God. But don't be that way. Don't be that type of Christian. When you say you're going to do something, then do it. And if you can't do it, then say you can't. And it's okay. Okay. But here we see Hannah making this vow to the Lord. Look again at verse 11 with me. 
She made this vow and she says, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall come upon his head. And verse 12 says, and it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. Could you imagine getting that comment to you? Here you are pouring your heart out. You're wanting to uh, cut this vow, this deal with the Lord. And then Eli, the priest comes and says, how long are you going to be drunk? How disrespectful it is for you to come and be drunk. But Hannah answered in verse 15 and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maid servant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief I have spoken until now. Then Eli answered and said, go in peace, and the God of Israel grant you petition which you have asked of him. And she said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. She presents her petition to God, and you know the verse. What do you do? You present it, and the peace that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. When we have a problem, when we have a situation that needs to be dealt with, what do we need to do? We need to take it to the Lord. Now, brethren, we know this. Every time we pray, and we talked about this this morning in class, when we pray, we don't actually receive uh, everything that we ask for sometimes, do we? But should that discourage us from praying our prayer? No, we know how to pray, don't we? We understand what it means to present our request to God. When I ask for somebody to be healed, when I ask for somebody to not be sick anymore, for the doctors to be with them, you know, when you go to the nursing home, uh, one of the prayers that I always pray with uh, the one there is, Lord, be with the doctors and the nurses as they take care of them and allow them to do it to the best of their ability. Why would I pray that? Just to make that person feel good? No, because I want the Lord to help those doctors and to help those nurses to actually take care of them as the best that they can. Here was Hannah. She was bitter in the soul. She was sad. She was frustrated. She was confused. All of these emotions going through her head. She presents this request. And we see in verse 18, it says, So the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. She had a peace about her. And watch what happens in verse 19. Then they rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord, and returned and came to their house at Ramah. Then Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord did what? He remembered her. He remembered her. Brethren, don't think God ain't watching. Don't think God ain't paying attention. Don't think for one minute that your prayers are not heard. In your time of struggle, in your time of need, God is always listening. And what a blessing that is, amen? We don't serve a God who spun the clock and just sat back and said, I'm going to the beach and I'll see you later. Oh, no. Our God is a God who pays attention. Our God is a God who wants to have a relationship with us. Brethren, do we want it in return? Verse 20 says, so it came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel, saying, because I have asked for him from the Lord. Now the man Elkaniah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice in his vow. But Hannah did not go up. 
For she said to her husband, not until the child is weaned, then I will take him, that he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. So Elkaniah, her husband, said to her, do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only let the Lord establish his word. Then the woman stayed and nursed her son until she had weaned him. Now when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bulls, one ephah of flour, and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. Then they slaughtered a bull and brought the child to Eli. And she said, Oh, my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you here praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me petition, which I asked of him. Therefore, I also have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. So they worship the Lord there. I know that was a lot of reading, but now let's make some application. So not only does Hannah make this vow, what ends up happening? Hannah keeps her vow. After the Lord blesses her with a child and she conceives, she makes good on what she said. She gives the child to Eli after he's weaned. Now, there's some speculation on when this weaning was, right? Some would say that Samuel was age three to five. Others would say that it was 24 months. Do we actually know? No, we don't. But we know this, that the Bible says that he was young, He wasn't old. He was a young boy, maybe a small child between the ages of one to five, probably. Uh, There was a reference, and it's not an inspiration uh, book. It's a Maccabees, and there was a Uh, some talk about how long it was before the child was weaned. I don't remember the exact verse on it, but basically it said three years old is when uh, the Jewish tradition for a child to be weaned was. Could that be it? Possibly. Uh, Does it really matter? No, not really. Because what we do know is that Hannah kept her word. She keeps her vow. And look at what she says in verse 28. She says, therefore, I also have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. So they worshiped the Lord there. Just because the deal was over, as she dropped off Samuel, do we think that Hannah didn't talk to him anymore? No, look how the verse ends. It says, so they worshiped the Lord. What was Hannah teaching her son? Or what had she been teaching her son? You know, children are like sponges, aren't they? (laughs) I've given illustrations over and over about things that I've said that I hear the parrot in the back saying in the car seat, right? Things that I don't really want repeated, not bad words, okay? I haven't said any bad words that Libby has repeated, but I've been close a couple times. I'll admit it. But children are like sponges. They soak up everything around them. So how do children learn to pray? How do children learn the importance of coming together with the assembly? Why is it important to worship the Lord, Daddy? Why do we do what we do, Mommy? Hey, Pa, how come we do this? How come we do that? What a great time for us, brethren, to be able to teach our kids What a great time it is, grandparents, to teach our kids. What a great time, congregation, to teach our kids. Just because you 
may not have a little bitty child here. Just because you don't have a high school kid here, does that mean that you're irrelevant? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I was just talking over here about teaching classes. Miss Anola was talking about teaching classes, and the, I could see the excitement on her face. And you know, that is such a blessing because she doesn't have any little children down there. But these little children get to see grown-ups doing God stuff. Is that what we're about? Hey, teenagers, hey, college kids, is that what you're about? Or is it all about us? Have we become so selfish in our lives that we can't even see the big picture? Do you know how much of an effect you can have on these little ones? By having your Bible open, by encouraging them to read some verses, by being a mentor to them on things. Hey, sit down and sit by me. Hey, sit right here and we'll sing songs together. Or am I looking at the time thinking, man, I'm ready to get out of it. Matt said it was going to be short tonight. They learn those things from their parents. They learn those things from their grandparents. They learn those things from their aunts, from their uncles. They learn those things from the adults and also the children of the congregation. Have we as parents, have we as grandparents, have we as a congregation dedicated our lives to teach our children how much God loves them? Have we dedicated our lives as the role models, as the examples for how a Christian should be To show our children what their purpose is in life? What is our purpose, brethren? Is it not to seek him with all of our heart? Is it not to seek the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, and to love him? Absolutely it is. What kind of example are we? Here was Hannah living in such a way. She didn't have what she wanted. Now she's got this child. And what does she do? She goes and they worship together. Proverbs 22, 6. We know this verse. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. Are we teaching our children how to be men? Fathers? Are we teaching our Girls, how to be women, mothers? Are we teaching them how those things go in life? Are we teaching them the things that they need to do? Are we encouraging those little precious souls when we have them in class? Because when they're old, when they have to make the decision for themselves, it could be that one thing that they remember, that one text, that one comment, that one time when somebody said that one thing, I remember when Gracie told me this. I remember when Sarah Wright told me that. That could change their life. Is it that important to us, brethren? Do we want another generation to grow up that doesn't know the Lord? Do we want the next generation to grow up and know the Lord less than we do? Brethren, if we don't get on our toes, if we don't get in the ball game, we're going to have a whole generation that is worried about the phone and nothing else. Nothing else. I got to get on Facebook. I got to get on Instagram. I got to post this post. Why? Because Facebook has become God. Brethren, Facebook ain't God. I'm going to tell you that right now. Whether you post it or not, God still knows what's going on in your life. The inside of you is like a lamp. 
What about a Proverbs class? I'm telling you, that Proverbs, that book of Proverbs is some incredible stuff. It was written thousands of years ago, and boy, the applications just keep popping up that are so true for today. Are we training up our children in the way that they should go? So when they're old, when they're far off, when they're in college, when they can make their own decisions, brethren, when I got in college, I wasn't thinking about God, not because my parents didn't teach me those principles, but because I didn't want to hear it. But oh, how I wish I would have listened. Oh, how I wish I would have set my mind to do the things that I was supposed to do. College kids, high school kids, when you're out and you're by yourselves, remember those things that your parents have tried and tried to teach you. And why they did it. Not because they were trying to lord over you, because they love you and they care about you. I'm speaking from the heart tonight. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. And you think, wait a minute, how in the world, Matt, are you way over here on the story of Hannah? (laughs) You don't think Hannah loved Samuel? She gave him to God. Could you do that? I don't know if I could hand Libby over. I know it's been a long time ago, but I don't know if I could hand Isaac over. Say, here you go. Take care of my little one. But what did Hannah have? Trust in the Almighty God. Brethren, what we're doing is right. What we're doing is correct. Think about what Ephesians 6.4 says. And I know it's talking about fathers. But fathers, parents, do not provoke your children to wrath. But bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. We have a job to do. Lives are at stake. Congregation. People will leave when they get in college and never come back. How sad that is. They'll never come back. Why is that? Is it because we haven't taught them the things that they were supposed to do because we blamed it on the parents? What's the disconnect? Every opportunity that we have with a child, with a teenager, with a brother or a sister, we have an opportunity to encourage, to strengthen to build up. That's why it's so important to be together. The world is not for us. The world wants you at the house watching Netflix. The world wants you worried about something else. But God says, no, I want you here. I want my people together. I want my people stirring each other up for love and good works. Hannah was blessed. Hannah received an absolute blessing from the Lord. How many of us in here can say that God has blessed you with something? I see a lot of babies up in here. I see a lot of babies crying and needing their diapers changed up in here. What a blessing that is. Amen? Parents, grandparents, great-grandparents. Aunts, uncles, congregation, we got a whole new batch coming up that can be trained in the admonition of the Lord. If we want our children to love the Lord, if we want our children to study the Word of God, what must we do? Set the example. How much time do we spend at home studying the Bible? You know, one of the things that I'm struggling with, and it's hard for me because it's an easy babysitter, is Libby getting on the phone. (laughs) Because I ain't got to mess with her for a while, right? And I'm not saying and I'm not up here talking about get off your phone and don't use it because I use my phone. 
I use it a lot, and it's very helpful. But boy, what a poison it can be if we're not careful. Don't let your phone raise your kids. Grandparents, help with this. Congregation, don't get in somebody's... (laughs) I'm not saying go get in somebody's business and tell them how to teach, raise their kids. I, I'm not up here saying that. I'm saying be an encouragement and help the way you can. We all know this. This is a congregation that knows stuff. We have knowledge. We have wisdom. Use it when we're trying to help these children. Use it when we're trying to encourage Have we made a vow to the Lord to raise our children and to help them understand their purpose in life to seek Him? I hope that you've made a vow. Not in the way of the Old Testament, but in the vow that said, you know what? I'm going to dedicate my life to serve you with all my heart and with all my soul. And what comes with that is keeping your commandments. And one of your commandments is to train up my child in the admonition and the training of the Lord. How much time, seriously, do we spend with our children at home talking Bible? Is it gone? Have we lost it? As we begin this week, Let's dedicate our lives as parents and brethren to help our kids love the Lord. Amen? Will you do that? Hey, maybe you hadn't done such a good job. It's okay. Today is a new day. Today is the day that you can change the way that you live. I want you to think about what Hannah said in her prayer as we close. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, look at what Hannah says. And Hannah prayed and said this, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn, my power, my strength is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. No one is holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. This is my verse right here. (laughs) Nor is there any rock like our God. Amen. There ain't no rock like our God the one you can lean on, the one that you can depend on, the one that ain't going to break, the one that ain't going to run when you got a problem. Now, it may take some time. It may take some situations to take place, but how much do you trust him? We see this over and over and over again in the Bible, the blessings that the Lord has for us. Is he your rock? Is he the one who you rejoice in? Rejoice in him this week when you go to work and somebody bad mouths you. Rejoice in him this week when somebody says something real out of way to you. Rejoice in him, kids, when your parents are having a bad day and they say something that they probably shouldn't have said in that tone to you. Forgive them and help them out and be a support to them. Brethren, I love you. I'll be strong and be courageous this week. Don't let Satan it out. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Maybe you're here today and you need prayers. Thank you, guests, for being here. What a blessing it was for you to be here. Maybe you're here today, friend, and you're not a Christian, though. Let me just say this. One day Jesus Christ is coming back. And he's going to come get his children. What a shame it would be for you to not be in that group. Maybe you're here today and you're thinking about becoming a Christian. Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. 
Mark 16, 16. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Peter, on the day of Pentecost, told those Jews who were cut at the heart to repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. If you need to be added to the body of Christ, if you need your sins washed away, come right now. Together we stand and sing.